Hi everyone, my name is Emily Davis and I am the Assistant Director for Student Activities and Involvement at the University of San Diego. Today I'm going to be talking with you about creative and intentional programming and we'll be going through some topics including virtual engagement, collaboration, accessibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as learning outcomes. First, we'll talk about the area of virtual engagement. Uh, you might have already experienced this a bit as you shifted your events online in spring 2020, and we expect some restrictions to events on campus this year, but we also encourage you to adapt your events to be virtual and believe that there's a lot of great ways to do this. Our top tip is to think creatively and out of the box. There are some resources attached, um, the USD Virtual Activities website. You can also put any of your virtual events on this website. We have some virtual programming ideas. You can check out the TPB at Home programs. And we also highly suggest checking out what other schools are doing. So ask your friends, look at social media pages, and see what you might be able to bring virtually to USD. It's important to keep in mind that some students might be attending USD from their homes next year instead of coming back to campus. And so you'll want to make sure that you think inclusively about how to get them connected as well. Next, we're going to talk about collaboration, which is a really great way to get a bigger event audience, get to know different students on campus, and get to work with a different organization or department. And if you choose to collaborate, we have a few tips for you. First is communication being key, so making sure you're on the same page about every aspect of the event with whoever you're working with. And then it's natural to disagree and conflict is okay. Uh, and we just encourage you to talk through things and allow the conflict to make your event stronger rather than to ruin the success of your event. Collaboration does not equal compromise. So we believe that there are ways to incorporate many ideas and that each organization should be very proud of the end event that you produce. You can be nice and firm at the same time. So understand what your non-negotiables are like budget or date um, or the amount of audience and make sure you're talking about that and being clear about that in the beginning of the process to decide if your collaboration will be successful. And finally, check your schedules. So are people from the two groups able to meet regularly? Do you have the same event date in mind? Are both groups able to contribute equally over the planning process? These tips will help make your collaboration a success. Now we're going to move into talking about accessibility. And so as event planners, we should always be striving to create experiences in which people can participate and feel as the event was truly made for them as an individual. And as in terms of accessibility, it's that the practice of making all experiences available for the many needs of your event attendees. So we'll be talking about the five topics um, for accessibility, including physical space, sound, food, marketing, and finances. First, we have physical space. So just some considerations, um, being stairs, making sure each part of the event can be accessed without stairs, um, having sufficient seating options, even if your event is mostly standing room, uh, as well as companion seating for people who use we wheelchairs to make sure their groups can stay together. And these are um, all tips to help make the event more accessible for people who use wheelchairs or have different limited mobility. We want you to know where gender inclusive restrooms are in relation to your event space and you can check out a map for locations at USD and you might not know all of this about your space, but there are experts so your USD scheduler can answer any questions you have about increasing accessibility in the space you have reserved. Our next topic is sound and ways to support people who are deaf or hard of hearing at your event. So first is a microphone, and it's super important to always use a mic when speaking to large groups of people. And we've attached a video if you want to learn more about the importance of mics. We also want you to use closed captioning and accurate closed captioning on any videos you show. So you can Google how to uh, add that if your video doesn't have that already. And finally, with the topic of sound, challenge the norm. A lot of people might say they don't need a mic or they don't like reading the words in the closed captioning on a video. But we encourage you to share that these choices are very intentional to allow everyone to fully participate in the event. 
Our next topic is food, and we all know food is one of the best ways to get students to come to an event. However, it can also be a really key way to make students feel like the event wasn't made for them if they don't have food that they can eat. Uh, so some things to consider, avoiding higher risk allergens if at all possible. We wanna make sure you're labeling common allergens and dietary restrictions, which are listed here. Offering a wide variety of food that meets different dietary needs and preferences. Um, again, some different options are listed there. And inclusion, making sure you have adequate food for each dietary restriction. So having a full meal available for anyone who falls into the different categories of food needs. And also being able to provide the resources. So someone with a strict or uncommon allergy might need to consult a restaurant and their website for more information. So make sure you have your menu and catering information available. And we encourage you to learn more about these nuances with menu planning and have listed a Harvard University events article that talks all in depth about all of these different options. Marketing is another area where accessibility is really important to consider. So the first thing that we have that might be new to a lot of people is the idea of camel casing your hashtag. So this means using a uh, capital letters to signal the next word in a hashtag. And it makes it easier for people to read if they use screen readers or if they have dyslexia. So an example is in the hashtag Toreros together, you'd capital T for Toreros and you'd capital T for together. And we've included a link to learn more. You want to make sure to provide contact information in case people have questions about accommodations at the event. Market your event with multiple methods with lots of time in advance of the event so people can receive the information in the method that works best for them. Providing alternative text for any images, especially digital flyers, is really important. Alternative text is uh, a description you're able to write on um, social media websites uh, that describes what's being portrayed in an image for someone who is unable to see it. And we have a quick little video, 60 seconds, about alternative text linked. And finally, diverse and inclusion. Uh, do the people on your flyer represent the community who's invited to the event? Are you using gender neutral language to welcome everyone? Recognizing that from the very beginning of your marketing efforts, you need to show and demonstrate how the event is welcoming all people on campus. The last accessibility topic we're going to talk about today is finances. So whenever possible, we would love if your event was free for all students to attend. And if that's not possible, we just encourage you to build your budget to allow to waive the fee for students in need. If you're hosting a philanthropy event, we use suggested donations so everyone can participate within their own financial means. So not just it's $10 to attend this event, but we suggest a donation of $10 to attend this event. The last piece of finance accessibility is just using your budget responsibly. We want you to think ethically and not extravagantly with your money as it's all put on with student fees or dues. So think about how your budget can serve as many students as possible. So let's talk about cultural appropriation. This is often perpetuated in student events through themes or activities that negatively stereotype a culture. And we're gonna show you a quick video just to explain a little bit more about what cultural appropriation looks like in action. They say imitation is the highest form of flattery. But what happens when it's not so flattering? The more you learn about the world and the people in it, you quickly realize just how beautiful and diverse it is. So where's the line between cultural exchange, appreciation, and appropriation? Why does it even matter? Here are seven myths about cultural appropriation debunked. You're just looking for something to be offended by. It's just clothing, hairstyles, decorations, whatever. Don't you have something better to worry about? Okay, first off, it's possible to care about more than one issue at a time. The main problem with cultural appropriation comes from dominant groups borrowing 
from marginalized groups who face oppression or have been stigmatized for their cultural practices throughout history, like cornrows. I mean, anyone can wear their hair in cornrows, but black people still face stigmas for wearing them along with perfectly natural hairstyles like braids and locks. There are even companies and schools that prohibit these natural hairstyles. People have actually been fired for wearing braids. Meanwhile, fashion models and celebs like Kylie Jenner get praised for wearing cornrows. And that's the main point. One group is being penalized by institutions for wearing natural hairstyles, while the other is called edgy and stylish for doing the exact same thing. I'm doing it because I think it's beautiful and exotic. I'm just showing appreciation for the culture. Look, it's great that you find another group's culture beautiful, but in order to show you truly love it, you need to have respect and understanding. Take, for example, tribal tattoos. The Maori of New Zealand have facial tattoos with deep family meaning and cultural significance. But fashion designer Jean-Paul Gaultier used the tattoos in ads to sell sunglasses. And that's a perfect example of cultural appropriation. No matter how much the designer liked the look, he stripped the tattoo of all of its cultural meaning just to sell a product. Now, if you really appreciate something, you should respect it instead of assuming you can use it however you want. Well, I don't find it offensive. And I asked someone from that culture and they said it was okay. Well, it's not your culture that's being disrespected. So sure, you don't find it offensive. And if you know someone from that background who doesn't mind your tattoo, costume, or whatever, that's cool. But remember that one person doesn't speak for all members of that community. Whatever, fashion, art, film, music always borrows from other sources. Plus it doesn't hurt anyone. Sure, cultural exchange has been going on since the beginning of time, but exchange is mutual. It needs to be done respectfully. A couple of years ago, Katy Perry did a geisha themed performance with Japanese women dancing in the background. Not only was it super stereotypical, her outfit wasn't even from the right country. The Japanese American Citizens League said it best, the thoughtless costuming and dance routines by Katy Perry played carelessly with stereotypes in an attempt to create a Japanese aesthetic. And that kind of crushes the idea that appropriation is harmless. You're just trying to tell everyone what to think. Hello, thought police. Have you ever heard of the First Amendment? Nobody's telling you what to think, wear, or say. Marginalized people can't stop you from doing your thing, even if they wanted to. But if you think you have the right to use any cultural tradition just cause, that's where you get into oppressive territory. And if you genuinely don't care if someone is hurt by your appropriation, that's just crappy. So because I'm white, I'm automatically racist. And if I wear this clothing, I'm even more racist. This isn't about beating up on white people. Anyone can appropriate elements of marginalized cultures. Heck, Pharrell even made the mistake of wearing a Native American headdress on the cover of Elle magazine. And after getting some much deserved flack, he actually issued an apology. If Chinese people wear blue jeans, aren't they appropriating my culture? Or what about black girls wearing blonde weaves? Or how about speaking English? Okay, this is a tough one. Assimilation and appropriation aren't the same thing. Marginalized people conforming to standards set by dominant, or in this case, Western cultures, is often a means of survival. When your cultural heritage is looked down on, often people change or hide things about themselves in order to be accepted by majority culture. For example, there are schools where students have been punished or even suspended for speaking Spanish or indigenous languages. So there are people who are literally being forced to assimilate or else. So it's not really a fair comparison. So you're saying I should never enjoy another culture? That's not fair. Not at all. For example, say you're invited to an Indian wedding and you're not Indian. Wearing a traditional sari or getting henna would be a great example of cultural exchange. You're being invited to participate and enjoy the culture instead of just picking and choosing parts of it for yourself. You can also travel, take cooking classes, read books, listen to music, and visit museums if you really want to learn about and enjoy other cultures. Here's the thing. Cultural appropriation is about a privileged group misrepresenting and disrespecting marginalized cultures. The originators rarely get credit, but always deal with the consequences. The goal isn't to shame you out of wearing or enjoying certain things, but listening to the people from the culture you're interested in shows you have a genuine love, respect, and understanding for something that's not your own. I hope that was helpful to explain a little bit more about cultural appropriation and really important for folks to learn about how to avoid that in student organizations as well as your everyday life. Another aspect to consider is your purchasing power. Think carefully about the vendors you're choosing for your event and try to select vendors that promote your organization's mission. To support, we have um, on campus, the Mulvaney Center has a local vendor initiative to support vendors in Linda Vista. And our program board has also curated a list of Black-owned businesses to support in San Diego. 
in event planning, representation matters. And so we want you to thoroughly research your potential speakers or performers that you're bringing on. Strive for diverse representation for people who will be in the front of the room and make sure that the experts who are speaking are really representative of the students who will be attending. Make sure your event's overall message is in line with your organization's mission and your event learning outcomes, which we'll talk more about soon. And consider including a variety of perspectives on a certain topic in order to bring a wide breadth of knowledge into the room. Inclusivity in the era of COVID-19 is another thing we need to navigate in fall 2020. So there will be limitations on the number of students who can gather at an event. And you can consider the following tips to make sure everyone can participate, such as live streaming or recording your event, offering multiple sessions, encouraging pre-event signups to limit lines or the event filling up too fast. We really think it's a great idea to supplement your in-person event with virtual content or engagement so people can be able to engage if they're not comfortable leaving their rooms or they need to stay at home due to COVID, uh, that they would be able to engage online and making sure that you're enforcing safety measures such as masks and physical distancing. Land acknowledgements are another way you can honor that your event is happening on traditional indigenous land. We really encourage you to check out the link provided to learn more about the importance of land acknowledgements. And one thing that's important is that you shouldn't only be doing a land acknowledgement before an event, but also striving for your organization to go beyond that and seek out ways to practice allyship towards the indigenous community. If you choose to offer a land acknowledgement, you can use USD standard language. I want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation, both past and present, and their continuing relationship to their ancestral lands. Finally, we've provided you with some questions that can help guide you while you plan your event, and you can also see some examples of events that don't fit into our guidelines of inclusivity in the USD community. Ask yourself the following questions. Does this program stereotype individuals or groups? Is this person open to all members of the community who are interested? If you are using cultural traditions as a part of your event, have you thoroughly researched them and are you accurately implementing them? Does your program promote a particular perspective under the appearance of neutrality? Is the program accessible for students who are differently abled? Is your marketing accessible? Can someone with dietary restrictions fully participate? Does your event have multiple ways for students to participate? And as you ask yourself these questions and consider what we've talked about in this presentation thus far, we are confident that you'll be able to strive and create events that will be more inclusive for the entire USD community. All right, we're on our last section, and you might be thinking with all of this information I've learned about event planning, how do I really make sure my events are meaningful? And we want you to start with a purpose. So what do you want your guests to learn or take away from your event? And this thing that you want your guests to learn is called a learning outcome, and it helps make sure your event is focused around a central purpose. And so you can see just some examples of different types of learning outcomes for events. Um, below. USD also has co-curricular learning outcomes for all undergraduate students, so we're going to go through those really quickly. Uh, the first is well-being and the ability to embody a healthy mind, body, and spirit. And you can see the different dimensions of well-being below, including self-care and relationships and decision-making. The next is purpose, and we want you to be able to discover your purpose in life. And this includes determining your values and your beliefs and your future vocation, what you'll do after you leave USD. The third CCLO is courageous living, being able to awaken your inner strength. And this is about being able to tolerate uncertain conditions and put yourself out there, risk in order to grow and be resilient when you find yourself in hard times. The fourth is identities and communities and the ability to explore who you are in relation to others. And so we want you to be able to understand your own uh, cultural competencies as well as the diverse communities that 
exist in San Diego and at USD and to learn how to approach difference with curiosity, vulnerability, and empathy. And the final CCLO is authentic engagement. So activating and initiating positive social change. We are a change maker campus and we wanna make sure that you can have meaningful dialogue with others and really learn how to advocate for yourself and your communities. These CCLOs are a great example of what you can use for a learning outcome for your event. And if you put your event on Salesforce in order to swipe students in for attendance, you'd actually be required to choose one of these CCLOs. So you can explore these slides at your own pace to learn a little bit more about the types of events that you might have if you were um, going to use one of these co-curricular learning outcomes. For example, if you wanted to help build resilience for your members, you might collaborate with the Center for Health and Wellness Promotion to host a stress management workshop. Here are some more examples um, to help explore values and beliefs. Maybe if you're an academic organization, you could host a panel to discuss ethics in your area of interest. And you can see there's so many different types of examples throughout here. And we're also happy to share um, and help you determine what the best CCLO would be for your event uh, if you want to talk to, the, to our office. And with that, that concludes our session on creative and intentional programming. And we can't wait to see what events you host this year.